ഓം സദാശിവ സമരംഭം ശങ്കരശാര്യമജമം അസ്മദശാര്യപര്യന്തം വന്ദേ ഗുരു പരം പരം ഈശ്വരോ ഗുരാത്മതി മോട്ടിവേദ വിഭാഗിനെ വ്യോമാപ്ത വ്യപ്ത ദേഹായ ദാക്ഷിണമൂർത്തയ നമ സാവവേദാന്ത സേദാന്ത ഗോചരം തമഗോചരം ഗോവിന്ദം പരമാനന്ദം സാത്ഗുരു പ്രണതോഷ്മഹം ഓ നമസ്തേ ഓക്കെ So we we have seen yesterday na no? Swami Paramarthananda unfolding the words of uh, Krishna Guru na no? uh, on those verse in which Arjuna was complaining or crying a little bit or expressing its helplessness and hopelessness in regards to his mental condition and uh, any good teacher is going to to tell the students don't worry you know it is an universal problem but it can be overcome and that's what krishna does and uh and then he goes especially swami paramartananda ne who studied over the teachings the the unfoldments present by shankaracharya ne he breaks it down to explain the three kinds the four kinds of obstacles and then uh, we see that arjuna is mostly complaining about uh, a wandering mind na a wandering mind that prevents him from focusing on the teachings basically na and then he says uh, i have a good intellect when i hear the teachings or i read the teachings i understand and uh, i i i agree i find it brilliant but my ability to retain the teachings so that it can help me on certain difficult moments of my life such as here in the middle of the battlefield in which i have to fight or not to fight so these teachings are easily forgotten huh what shall i do my mind is very slimy when i see she is already wandering thinking of many other things <clears throat> and forgetting its true nature as limitless sachitananda brahman i know you told me that i need to be able to discipline educate my mind yeah <clears throat> normally known as mental mind control or mental control in a good sense not in a positive sense such as brainwash the entire humanity to direct them in a certain uh, uh direction but in a good sense mind control i want to control those thoughts feelings emotions and attitudes that are not conducive to my spiritual development and he says i can't do it please help me please help me In the beginning he said on the chapter 2 he says please teach me help me i i surrender to you well yeah? now on the 10th uh, on the 6th chapter again after having received teachings and instructions he again says so what shall i do help me because how i am going to discipline this wandering mind na huh? wandering mind produce mental emotional turbulence that leaks you know it, it somehow it uh, it overflows into into the breast of the entire body mind sense complex uh, beginning through the sense organs and then the pranas the physical body and so on So I don't enjoy having this disturbed mind. It affects my entire uh, system. It goes all the way down to my physical body, causing even 
uh, physical illnesses. Huh? I want to be the master, not the servant of this mind. I want to purify my intellect to the extent that I, I take mastery over this body-mind sense complex and I can direct my life towards self-knowledge and freedom. Mur du Sudana Sarasvati defines this balava of the mind. Bala of the mind is discipline in the mind, controlling the mind, no, I believe. Oh no, balava, balada is a negative tendency of the mind. Yeah, right? Bad attitudes of the mind. Oh, if I remember well, let me see here. Let's see, it's it's going to explain itself. Uh, this uh, Sarasvati uh, Mudas Sudana defines the balavda of the mind as vicharena. Da, da, da. Even by arguing with the mind and persuading it, it's not listening. So it is the those stubbornness of the mind that resists resists to be reprogrammed, resists to 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 begin and thinking and responding to to life in the light of the revealed teachings of the Vedas. So the mind has developed such a, a hardwired, profound uh, <clears throat> tendencies and vasanas that uh, it becomes like, you know, stubborn. So, and it's very firm in its, in its ignorance, in its, you know, certainty. Uh, but now I do my way and only my way. I'm I've always done this way and I don't like change. Oh, but it's causing so much suffering. I don't care. I like what is familiar to me. More or less on those lines. Yeah? The, mice, the, the mind will not listen. You may try to persuade the mind, but it's going to resist because it became so strong, so hard, you know, so firm. You know? It's uh, it's in its own way it becomes firm. If the mind is hovering around a particular topic, a particular person or a particular incident, I try to take the mind away from that field. Do not think about that. He might have insulted you and this and that. You know, you may be concerned and uh, preoccupied, afraid or desireful. But uh, you say, no, I don't want to think on those lines anymore. So don't think that it's that easy uh, to dictate the mind. Vasanas dictate whatsoever the mind is going to think about. So it, it is a process by which you need to cultivate good, good vasanas. But uh, I will try to tell the mind not to go back to that line of thought that... Uh, cause even more uh, rigidity, even more reinforcement of my ways of uh, thinking, my attitudes, my words, and my deeds. So, and then he makes an analogy about jackfruit. Uh, in India, there is some jackfruit. Here in Brazil, there is a lot. It's so over the place that nobody wants it around here. And uh, when I came in here, I remember that my childhood and I started getting some, it's very undigestible. And then people told me, yeah, it's it's very tough fruit. Uh, it's very undigestible. It has some toxin in there. But in India, there are some jackfruits. And since people are very poor, they eat anything. And it has a stickness to itself that it sticks to your fingers. Have you, have you met a, a jackfruit? No? It's very sticky. And once it sticks to your hand, it's very difficult to remove it. And uh, such is the condition of the mind. The moment it starts touching the world of Namarupas, you know, and it starts sticking to the world, and then uh, it's very, world, very difficult to remove the world from the mind. This Anatima world is very, very indeed sticky.
Balavada, here he, he mentioned, so Balavada means independently uh, strong. The mind is so strong, firm, uh, stubbornly stru <coughs> strong, you know, it does not move. It's very hard, very hard to reprogram or deprogram the mind. And unless I pull the mind from the anatoma world of people, places, things, events, and circumstances, desires, and fears, and so on, how can I channel the mind to the scriptures that reveal my nature as Satchitananda Brahman? So it would be better if Bhagwan would provide us with two minds, one to do the spiritual work and another to, to transact with the world so that we keep our, our spiritual mind clean to do the mind, the work. But since we have seen in, in different texts and passages, even of these texts, we have only one mind. Hmm. And we need to, as, as householder, as grihastas, we need to transact in the world. Transaction will leave tendency impressions, which are going to uh, bring about the formation of one's vasanas. Yeah? And uh, we have no no second mind to, to keep it clear and clean. And uh, so how are we going to be a householder and yet, you know, keep the mind health? wise, discipline. So it's challenging. We have only one mind. And the mind should never be let allowed to stick to the anatma world of Namarupas so that it can be direct to the the scriptures that reveal the true nature of the self whenever uh, instructed. Okay, mind, okay, no need to go out there, no need to think of anything, just let's bring our awareness to the scriptures that reveal our true nature as the body-mind, as limitless consciousness. So oh, it's the same mind. There is no other way. The only way is to develop a very health, balanced, you know, lifestyle that allows us to interact and transact and navigate in this world, this mutual world, this challenging mutual world of duality, yet maintaining a certain degree of uh, mental sanity or mental uh you know, health one thing is to keep it uh, sane yesterday i had a conversation with someone who wants to talk to me he's a student of mine here in brazil and uh as we you guys most probably have understood we are we are living through very turbulent times and uh, and she has a husband uh, and a few children, and she is interested in Vedanta. But uh, the mind is is just not. Uh, I mean, it's very difficult to keep um, the mind's health when you are struggling to survive in a in a structure, society structure that somehow is 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 collapsing now or, or, or it's going through uh, incredible levels of turbulence so how to keep the mind it's easier for us because we are somehow older and wiser and retired but just imagine if we would be young and trying to begin a life you know and having children and finding uh this anatomy world in the condition that we find it nowadays you know in, in the middle of a kali yuga so it's very difficult to maintain a health mind in such in such a circumstance. Yeah? But we don't have any other uh, option. We need to find a way to, to keep it as healthy as possible. And one of the keys here is to simply, simplify the mind so that uh, you can uh, make room for the shravana, manana, nididhyasana, you know, every day. Simplify your lifestyle. Oh no! Before that was, I want to be rich. I want to have this, and I had to buy a, a nice home. And and now I just, uh, I just want to get by and uh, 
and keep my mind else because the only way out here, the only solution here is is to go beyond Punya Papa, which is what is available in this dualistic realm. Therefore, it is Dridam. And because of these powerful qualifications of the mind, you know, it is turbulent. And it's firmly, stubbornly, turbulent because of this power qualifications. Yeah, aham mani. So I am what? Aham mani. So it is just a, a, a did stick to the world. The world has created impressions in the mind. So that is the unqualification of the mind, which is presented here as powerful qualification, which is uh, uh, fortitude, you know, and uh, firmness and fortitude, and it's very strong. And there, bah, no, you know, and uh, I have my ways. I'm going to rely on my vasanas, my mental, emotional attitudes, because, uh, you know, they are too strong for me to confront them. Ah, but it calls suffering, but that way at least it's familiar and I'm gonna go all the way with it. So it's it's a kind of a, uh, qualifications according to Swam Paramartananda, negative qualification, described here as aham manaye. Did you see what it means, aham manaye? Eu sou manaye? Aham. I am manaya. I consider sudus karam it being extremely difficult, almost bordering the impossible. Uh, what is difficult? Disciplining the mind, managing the mind, educating the mind. This is the most difficult thing to accomplish. That's why they say in the scriptures that Mano Jayaha is the biggest victory in life. Okay? So redirecting, purifying, refining, educating, disciplining the mind is the most, the biggest victory one can gain in life. You may win over other things. You may, may be successful in other areas. But uh, have you managed, have you established a health mind? Have you managed to educate your own mind so that your mind is no longer your enemy? but uh, it's your ally in this ultimate pursuit of moksha. So this is the real success of life. And that is what takes uh, a lot of time in this spiritual process. Uh, Krishna, I do not think I can succeed because my mind is what it is. I'm not able to manage my mind. I would require you to do that for me. I would require a management consultant and you are my guru and my friend. So tell me, teach me how I'm going to accomplish that. So, Sudhuskara so means extremely difficult. It's controlling or educating or disciplining or governing Directing the mind is as difficult as directing the wind, controlling the wind. Huh? And the Lord, with all its compassion, compassion answered Arjuna, saying, Oh Arjuna, undoubtedly, the mind is fickle and difficult to be restrained. Oh Arjuna, however, it can be restrained through detachment and persistence, practice. So he, did he say much? No, he just gave a note of encouragement. No. So it is uh, indeed very difficult. The nature of mind is like that. But the good news is that uh, it can be restrained. And uh, how so? Oh, let's say you have to develop vairagya, detachment from the anachima world of namarupas. Because if you don't develop detachment from the world that produce the thoughts which are desiring or fearing a certain object of experience, if you don't detach from the world, 
the vasanas are going to remain there. Very, very strong, dictating your thoughts, words, and deeds. Detachment. And then the second question here is how to bring about detachment. And then again, we go to the uh, two elements, two forces. One is willpower and the other is understanding the nature of the mind. Why it develops tendencies, vasanas, samskaras. And then once you understand the mechanism and then you can do what? So you can just go there examining the quality of your vasana load or samskaras. No? And then uh, and then see which ones uh, you're going to keep and which ones you're going to reject. In the beginning, you're going to, you know, you don't put up, put up a fight with them. No more. I want you guys out of my causal body. But it begins with detaching the mind from those worldly objects that uh, are well established in the subtle body as thoughts in regards to those worldly objects. The objects are still producing attraction and repulsion. Those forces are very disturbing and they compromise my faculty of discrimination. The only way to get detachment is a lot of willpower and understanding how the mind came at this level of insanity to the point of almost yeah, collectively destroying my, one more civilization in this planet. Now Krishna is present the remedy or the method in the next few verse that uh, is Vikshepaha Pariharaha. Parihara for the problem of Vikshepaha. Too much wandering, too much <laughs> extrovertedness. The first thing that Krishna does as an excellent, best possible teacher is to point out that it's not a unique problem of the student. It's a human being problem, at least in this planet. I mean, I don't know about ETs or, or other uh, other societies or civilization in other places. I haven't been. I, I don't know anything. But it's I mean to me. I know I know that in this planet things are like that. But is it possible that everywhere, if there is life, is going to be uh, all the time like this? So who knows? Uh, there are things we will never know. <laughs> But it's strange to think, I mean, life is such a mystery. Yeah? The nature of life, it's a the miracle of life. The nature of the, the mind and the world, it's such a mystery. Science will never going to come even close to understand it. And uh, it, there is a possibility that there is other, you know, complex intelligent organisms living in other areas of this vast universe. You know? I hope there are better places than here because here, you know, at least at this point, the scriptures say, oh, no, take it easy. You know, this is Kali Yuga. Then it comes a better Yuga. We don't, all we know is, you know, it's just 100 years of life. And you know, we say, oh, my God, why did I come here just at the beginning or at the end of Kali Yuga? <laughs> It is a universal problem because it is a universal problem. The scriptures itself discuss the problem. And once you know that it's not my only problem, but everyone's problem, you already feel better about yourself. Huh? Ah. This is a consolation price. I'm not alone. Huh? I have told you the example. If there is no power in the house, what the first thing you do? You will look in the neighborhood to see if they are also without power. If they have power, and then you start getting uh, a little bit restless with, oh my God, why only me? Uh, and then you have to dig to find the problem. But if everybody is without power, and then you relax and you feel much better about your situation. Okay, if the neighbor house also there is no power, you will feel liberated like as if you have reached moksha. They also are equally miserable. Huh? The problem of uh, 
communism, there is no ism that is going to solve the problem, which is fundamentally rooted on igno spiritual ignorance. Communism, socialism is going to say, let's you know, distribute the wealth among everybody. But what happens is that they draw a line very low in which everybody becomes equally poor, except the state. You know? So... Uh, the situation remains the same. Once you know that there are other people in the same boat, oh, it's okay, let's go equally, let's be equally very poor. Therefore, they say first acknowledge the problem, then you know how to handle the problem, accept the problem, then the remedy will come. And what's the solution? It's understand the nature of God. And then by understanding the nature of God, you're going to understand the nature of Avidya, this, you know, this strong ignorance imposed by God itself, you know, Maheshwara. But you need to understand the nature of God. And then how about, and then how it brought about this apparent order in which we live. And uh, not knowing exactly why human beings are so ignorant in, in here, you know, but uh, you 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 get the credit to come to the scriptures and you you hear Krishna say, uh, never mind, you know, just know that it's like that for everybody here. But uh, this situation can be changed, you know. The remedy is to understand first the nature of Shua, the nature of God, and then you're going to understand the nature of Jiva and why Jiva is suffering, you know. In the suffering because it not understood the laws and principles which are the struck that what the, the principles you know, that God structured this appearing order, mitya order of reality. You need to understand mitya you know, properly. And the solution is in mitya. The first stage is in mitya solution. How so understanding the nature of Ishwara Jiva Jagat. But the first thing is what? Acknowledge the problem and then look for help somewhere uh, where you, you least expect, okay? Because in the beginning, you want to find a solution uh, among the people or in the government or in, in all this theater that we see in the world. Oh, a solution on this side, this left, this right, and this and that, you know. The solution is in God, is understand the nature of ignorance, the nature of avidya, by understanding the nature of God, not knowing exactly why we are under the spell of so much ignorance here. And then he reminds that in the alcoholic anonymous, they, they follow that uh, script. First, you need to acknowledge, don't deny, I am an addicted. I surrender to that and I surrender to this group. I believe this group will help me to overcome this problem, but the first thing is to say, I am an addicted. I am an addicted. What addiction you have? Oh, I, I have a, an addiction towards Namarupas and uh, I believe them so much and the Namarupas I like is the one that gives me strong, uh, very nice sensory pleasures. I don't care much for knowledge or dharma or anything. I, I just want you to enjoy pleasurable experience. Yeah? And then in the process, I, I, I'm violating all the laws, so, but I'm addicted. You know, I can't stand, I can't help myself, as Duryodhana says. I know what dharma is, but I can't help. I am addicted. Accept the problem. Understand that it's making you suffering and other suffering around us. The entire humanity is suffering due to this fundamental ignorance and the addiction to believe that I am the center of this universe and I want what I want, when I want, the way I want. And if I don't get what I want, we're going to have war. Huh? It's more or less that. Small wars, big wars, global wars. Okay, Arjuna, you are not alone. Jesus' first step is a psychological step, is to console the mind 
of the adjective, adjected, and say, listen, it's uh, it's very common. So don't bring in a second layer of, uh, of problems by not accepting this. Yeah? Hey, Arjuna, Krishna is indirectly teasing Arjuna. Uh, say you are powerful enough to conquer all these enemies out there, but uh, you are telling me that you don't have the strength to handle your mind? Are you crazy? You are the great, greatest general. You have this inner strength, and if you don't, so just begin working to, to cultivate it. I understand what you say. In your statement, the mind is fickle and uh, it's extroverted and it's not very easily uh, manageable. This is a fact for everybody. This is the first step, consolation price. Okay. But it's not possible. You're going to need to go through Upasana. If you have understood the teachings of Dharma and Karma, but yet your mind is somehow compelling you to go against Dharma. It's, it's, it's not living in harmony with the laws of God is what creates suffering, mental disturbance, and uh, depression, extrovertedness, and so on. So... There are some proper methods. They begin with understanding Dharma, understanding your relationship with God, understanding how this avidya, cosmic ignorance, uh, dominates the mind of all human jivas here. Yeah? And, then, uh, and then once you have the clear picture of the situation, you understand the mechanisms by which the mind came to this condition, which produce very much suffering, you know, referred to as the sickness of samsara. And then you're gonna know that not only you have uh, karma and dharma uh, as um, discipline of understanding and acting upon aligned in harmony with your understanding, but now we present you with another mental discipline, which is upasana. No, Vipassana. So you're going to have to sit with your mind and start having a dialogue to educate the mind. I like this expression, educating the mind. Discipline is good. Controlling, I don't like much. Killing, forget about killing the mind. But uh, it's more like educating, disciplining the mind, that redirect the mind to think in harmony aligned with the revelations that somehow pacify the mind and makes the mind a good instrument so that one can live happily and in gratitude to the opportunity. What are these methods? There are two methods which is said in the Patanjali Yoga Sutra. Uh, Abhyasa Vairagyan Tati Siddhi. So the same thing you also find Kauteya, Abhyatsa, blah, 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 uh, proper practice. I explain it later to you. You first know the methods. The method is practice. Abhyatsa is the method number one. Vairagya is the method number two. So Abhyatsa goes for the, the, the willpower to sit with your mind and tell her, no, no. Don't go there, no, you know, come back here, you know, let's focus here. You know, this is one method. And the other is Vairagyam, which is only possible as we understand, you know, that uh, those mental tendencies to run towards one's ragas and vesha desires and aversions only cause suffering. So what is abhyasa? Now we should remember the mind is will always dwell upon anything without distraction in which it has got interest. So anything that we like, the mind is going to be dwelling upon. And sometimes when we 
dislike something big, 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 it becomes like impressions of some of some traumatic experience, the mind is going to be dwelling as well upon that without distraction. How so? It's going to be dwelling, saying as in, not again, what can I do never to have that experience again? Aversion. The mind can dwell upon anything. We know that the mind has the ability of one pointedness, focus. Just the mind has to be invested either to gain and keep or to avoid a certain object of interest. The mind has to got some interest in that object of experience. If I love reading novels, the mind is going to be very focused in my book. I forget everything around me. I easily attain the Kalpa Samaj with my book. I even forget to eat food. It reminds me of Ramana Maharaj that went by without eating for long periods of time because the mind was so absorbed in the self. If I liked cricket or any other sport or entertainment, the mind is going to think about it until the time comes. And then we have India versus pa Pakistan. And then Papa G used to cancel such song in days of good match such as that one. And, uh, and then we would say, okay, we have to learn to appreciate this stupid sport. <laughs> uh, if you love cricket, uh, you know what we were talking about here. Ah, he says, India against Pakistan, then what happens to our concentration is there. Before, during, and even after, remember you, if this, if that, so how great was the game for us, how bad it was. Some people get depressed when they lose, the, their team lose the game, no? All of that happens effortlessly. Can anyone say I don't have mental concentration? Nobody can say that because uh, what is going to produce mental concentration? One pointedness of mind. Vasana. A strong vasana. Okay? If you love something, your mind is going to be effortlessly focused on that thing. Okay? So now we need to reestablish our values and understand what is really valuable in life so that we can cultivate, develop, and maintain a vasana that's going to make it easier for me to direct my mind to the scriptures until this knowledge is absolutely clear and uh, properly internalized, digest, and so on. Because uh, this is what I love the most. This is what I love the most. So the bottom line is you need to, to be able to see the value of all of that in order to develop a vasana for that. And then the vasana creates a certain momentum, powerful momentum that cannot be stopped. The concentration will be there every time you the term that this is the most lovable thing in life. This is the most valuable thing in life. And what is this thing? Oh, it is a person, it is a movie, it is a game. Therefore, if I develop love for a thing, the mind is going to enjoy dwelling upon that thing. So how to develop love for God? appreciation for God, interest in God, so that the mind can be effortlessly dwelling on the scriptures that reveal the nature of Saguna and the nature of Brahman without distraction. How do you develop this undistracted mind, this interest in a particular field of knowledge such as God? By knowing its value. 
by understand its greatness, its supreme superiority. Okay, this is the ultimate value. We have to really look and reestablish our values in life and uh, and make a, a, a proper list until we, we, we know exactly, you know, what is the greatest value in life. Concentration requires interest, requires love, and love requires developing a, un, an understanding of the value of any and everything. So when you are a very small child, you don't have any value on any uh, intimate uh, association with uh, another creature of the opposite or the same sex. Yeah, the same gender. You don't have that. You need some chemicals to produce that attraction. Yeah? So how are you going to get to love something like you love things in life, not knowing that it's all part of a program? Your vasanas are directing you towards things that do not resolve your problem or even you know, chemistry is going to to experience an attraction for that which was the first or second love of your life, you know, intimate love. You need to understand life, determine its values until you get to higher values. And this process is called here Vivekaha Abhyasaha. It's a discerning, discriminating, and establishing one's values in life. Understand the superiority of uh, knowing, of dwelling upon God and its principles, laws, structuring our mutual reality. I need to, how I'm going to develop a value for something, how I'm going to be in love with something, the first thing is I need to get to know that thing. I need to get to, I need to be familiarized with that thing. I need to be introduced to that thing. You know, you go to a party, you are very young and very stupid, and then somebody introduce you to someone and then say, oh, I think you're gonna, you're gonna really love that person. Look, you know, and woo, no. So, do, do you fall in love immediately? No. You need to at least to know a little bit. Of course, there is a lot of projection. Yeah? First, you like, you like the shape. Yeah? And then you say, mm, I think it's a good person. But then you get to know the person. You need to know something to develop a real value for that thing. This, this is called Vastu. Vastu Vivekaha. So you will be developing health habits by knowing the greatness of what we call Dharma, the laws of God. In na nature, you will develop an interest in Dharma and then farther down the road, you will develop an interest not only in Dharma but in Moksha. And this is called, this is all called Vivekaha or Yin Yoga. Understanding, developing the knowledge, you know, the yoga of understanding. Is studying the scriptures, it means scripture study initially talk about the superiority of God and how we should walk away from the world of people, place, things, events, and circumstance, and then it just depend upon God so that later on we can declare our independence. Depending upon the things of the world are going to produce a life, a life, a, <clears throat> a mind living through unpredictable uh, events. 
it is the most serious thing. The more I understand that the dependence, dependence on these Mitya and Amarupas is going to produce mental disturbance, mental fluctuation. And I will see that it's not really intelligent to carry on on that path. Attaching, dwelling upon this world of Namarupas, you know, bidding my, you know, making a bid on them. No, I'm going to be okay if I depend on certain uh, things and circumstances. Nothing of this world is limitless and infinite. So anything we would dwell upon in terms of uh, namarupas of this world is going to be finite. Only God is infinite. Only God is worth to dwell upon. If you do not understand God, God will give you a few kicks here and there until you pay attention. Huh? Till you pay attention. You are suffering. It's God kicking you to see if you you change your ways. Later on, but only later on, we have to understand that uh, at even the dependence on God ultimately needs to be given up because the ultimate God is your very nature. So you are of Nirguna nature. Sagunishwara fundamentally is of Nirguna nature. We are all Nirguna Brahman. So you, you play on the triangular uh, format, depending on God, you know, cultivating uh, dharmic actions, thoughts, words, attitudes, vasanas, you get punya. And then you purify, refine, discipline the mind, educate the mind, and then the mind is going to become so health that in due time it will understand the final teachings of Vedanta. I am of Satchitananda nature. I am of Nirguna Atma nature. I am of the similar nature as Ishwara Atma and Brahma Atma, Paramatma. I am uh, free and independent from anything that Maya superimpose upon myself. Therefore, from God dependence, I move into self dependence, which is synonymous of independence. This independence or self dependence is the palam referred to as moksha. And therefore, the scriptures talk about the journey from world dependence to God dependence to self dependence, which is independence. How, what is wrong if I continue to, to keep my dependence on this Mitya world of Namarupas? People, place, things, uh, experience, events, circumstance, this realm, that realm, you know, anything. Interdimensional realms. What is wrong? I can keep, you know, uh, invested in this higher dependence. Why not to have a higher dependence? Oh, yes, yes, no, I want to have a, a different kind of dependence when I was young and stupid. Otherwise, I was uh, around a teacher who was fit, perfect for immature people like myself at the time. And then there was a time that the, 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 what was in fashion was from dependence to cool dependence. I don't know if you ever heard about that. So don't depend on the other. Establish a relationship that you depend on the other and the other depend on you. That way you are you were just leveled, you know? Codependence is not going to help. You need to transfer your dependence on others to dependence on God. What is wrong if I keep you know, my, my interest on others? 
so that I can lean on them. It's very risk. Dependence on this world is very risk because the world of people, place, things, events, and circumstances are constantly changing and fluctuating, highly fluctuating. You know, when you think that something is that thing, that thing is gone or it has changed, it's perishable, it is changing, it is fleeting. Depending upon a changing, fluctuating uh, world of Ramarupas is not going to provide us with any sense of security or stability. We are not, we're going to feel like our ground is shaking all the time. Thus, well upon these meteor facts, and anytime you have faith sorrow, try to equate, you will find that sorrow has been always because I have been depending upon things of this meteor world of Namarupas. Namarupas goes also to uh, events, circumstance, you know, experience, you know, situations. Oh, now, now I'm set. Now I, I have worked on the setup of my environment. I, I, I'm really good. Now, how, what did you do? What do you control? Your wife, your husband, uh, your boss? No, no, I control the setup. I, I'm very smart. I control the setup in my, in my town, my city, my, you know? So, and then Krishna will say, oh, very risky. The setup is not controllable. You know, it changes very, very suddenly. When you least expect, you lose your dependence, your whatsoever you believe you are, you know, leaning on to give you a sense of security. I should not have really depended on anything like, uh, uh, and then he, he reminds us the, the picture, the example of a drowning man catching hold of a, a straw, something very small, but it's the only thing available. There is only water, small thing I, I try to hold. You know, I mean, none of, going, none of these things is going to save anyone. It's meaningless. And thinking these lines, what is Nietzschean? What is a Nietzschean? What is ever secure? What is never secure? What is strong? What is weak? There is only one principle which is permanent. Um, and that is Nirvana Atima, our very nature, which is the nature of God. This Nietzsche Anitya Vastu Viveka, what is Changing is not worth anything. What never changed is real, and that's where I want to associate to. I want to establish a relationship with that which is never changing, permanently present, until I understand that that is, by the way, my very nature. And the, the scriptures only teach this. And with the help of the scriptures, Arjuna, you're going to manage to come to a point of dwelling on the scriptures without much difficulty. But first, you need to look into your lifetime, design your lifetime in such a way that it can facilitate the deconstruction of all, of all your bad vasanas, bad habits or addiction, until you are no longer dependent on any one of those objects of addiction. Very nice, this passage, yeah? Strong. So he, he anticipates a verse on chapter 10, verse 9. Uh, he did not translate the verse. And uh, if I would have read it before, I would pull the verse from 
around uh, chapter 10. But God dependence is also a habit. It is a vasana which can be developed. Oh, vasana, no, I, I don't want to have any vasana. You need a vasana, otherwise you cannot live on this world. You need to have certain knowledge, tendencies, you know, likes and dislikes, preference, preferably, preference. So establish in your subconscious mind so that you can transact in this world. You need to have vasanas. So develop God dependence vasana rather than people, place, things, events, and circumstances vasana. It's a much healthier vasana habit. It, it can be developed by following a religious spiritual lifestyle, which is nothing but developing a health and good vasana load, vasana towards God dependence, which later on will be also abundant. When I get used to this house vasanas towards, uh, let's remember, vasana is something that you, you are either extremely attracted to or, or afraid of, okay? Or repulsed by. Uh? So you want to have a, a, a positive attraction, vasana, towards something that you learn to value above anything and anybody and any other circumstance. Yeah? So you develop these vasanas yeah? because you understood that they are health vasanas, God dependence. And this God dependence are going to replace anatima dependence. This wonderful vasanas these uh, health vasanas, these spiritual religious vasanas are going to replace those unhealth vasanas. Sometimes uh, I try to picture that and, uh, and verbalize that as if uh, light and darkness, they can't coexist. If you have dark vasanas, it's enough that you bring vasanas of light, of wisdom, that naturally it's going to dispel those dark vasanas, those ignorance-based vasanas, okay? So in the old days, I would say, oh, it's almost as if our causal body, our unconscious mind has only a limit space, and then you bring good vasanas, the good vasanas are going to say, get out of here because there is limit space. So no. It's more like light dispels ignorance in all levels. Huh? So health vasanas, health habits will replace some health habits. If you want to reprogram or de-addict yourself from, from the love for unhealth things, you know, namarupas, develop good addictions, good vasanas. Gita class, for example, our study of the scriptures is a wonderful vasana. Let this vasana be a good addiction. Oh, addiction, I thought it was very bad. It's okay for now. It's a good addiction. It's a good dependence. It's leading you towards independence. Develop these kinds of vasanas, health vasanas, wise vasanas. You will find unknowingly, effortlessly, you will grow out of this condition, Arjuna. Uh, you will be no longer under the tyranny of these bad habits that brings about mental extrovertness and mental disturbance. So this is the promise of our scriptures. It carries on. I'm not going to have the time. I may have to address a few things here with my employee. Uh, I love this passage here. Unfortunately, we're going to have to wait until next Monday to get back to the beauty of Bhagavad Gita.
Anything else? I love the practicality of the Gita. Mm. It's just so compassionate. Yeah. The way it just to you. It's very, quite beautiful. Very, very practical. Yeah. I agree. Okie dokie. Anything from you, Sylvia? No. Okay. I was remembering uh, James was talking about Vasanas once, and didn't he say, correct me if I'm wrong, he said there's three types of Vasanas. The first type is like steam on a mirror. You can just rub it gently and it, it's gone. The second type type is like dust on a mirror which is heavily ingrained which you have to polish a little bit harder to get rid of and i believe the third one he said is like an unborn baby it's only going to come out when uh the time is correct for it to come out yeah 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 so is... i was just thinking yeah go ahead. thinking about that when you were reading this passage yeah yeah, yeah. This, uh, this is a scriptural analogy present in several of our texts Okay, these three levels okay. of, of uh, vasanas that we want to somehow overcome. Yeah, okay, don't you? I remember from la yesterday, maybe it was that uh, Swami P says, uh, just smile and continue. Mm. <laughs> just... <laughs> yes, yeah, this is nice advice. <laughs> okay, so we we meet again Friday with the canon, okay? Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purna Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnamevavashishate Om Shanti 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 Om <laughs> Namaste. Love you. See you. you. Love you too. Okay. Next Friday. Thank you. Thank you, Arvinda. Thank okay. you.